Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what we hope will be an enlightening and important conversation. My name is Lynn Brown. I'm executive director of the John Bradamus Center at NYU. We're going to talk today with some very knowledgeable and special people about some very important topics, which turn out to be as timely as today's headlines. Mass migrations caused by poverty, violence, natural disasters, the role of faith and politics in solving these problems, and the search for justice seasoned by mercy and compassion. All of these things come together in the book we are here to discuss, When Mercy Seasons Justice. And we're joined by the author himself and two knowledgeable, distinguished people who will help us in this conversation. Let me do some very brief introductions. They're, the bios of all of us are uh, in your material. Let me start with Jeff Thale, who's the president of the Washington Office on Latin America, a leading research and advocacy organization advancing human rights uh, in the Americas. He has followed and been a major part of US Central American policy since the mid 1980s. And he travels to the re region several times a year as he has uh, and most recently. He's taken multiple congressional delegations to both Central America and to Cuba. We're joined also by Ellen Toscano who has been at New York University for over 15 years. Uh, for many of those years as the director of NYU's campus in Florence, Italy. And for the last several years back here in New York um, to head up and be senior director of NYU in Brooklyn. Before coming to NYU, Ellen served as chief of staff and counsel to Congressman Jose Serrano of New York. While in Congress, she worked with Jeff uh, in El Salvador, and she herself also participated in several delegations to monitor the implementation of the 1992 UN Brokered Peace Accords and co-chaired the US Citizens Election Observer Mission to El Salvador. And we're joined by former Congressman David Bonier, uh, whose book we are here to discuss. David served for, as a member of Congress for 26 years from the state of Michigan, rising to become majority whip in the US House of Representatives, the second ranking position in the Democratic lineup, uh, a position he held for over 11 years until retiring from Congress in 2002. In Congress and since leaving Congress, David has been a leading voice for progressive causes, including the fight to defeat um, then President Reagan's CIA wars in Central America. And he is also a renowned author of several books. This in fact, by our count, is his seventh or eighth book. We've lost track uh, somewhat, but not only a book on topical areas, uh, topic areas like the Vietnam era veterans. He and his wife wrote a book on travels throughout the state of Michigan. He's authored a two-part autobiography, uh, the second of which follows his time in Congress and the first of which gives his roots growing up in Michigan. And now this is his book, uh, the book we're about to discuss is his first work of fiction. Um, and so that um, we wanna talk about that as well as the topic area is covered. Just a few housekeeping measures. We have an hour for discussion. We will leave time for questions, either interspersed throughout the conversation or to try to get to a few as we come to a close. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll be checking periodically. Mm -hmm. Our desire is to keep the tone informal and the structure loose-ish <laughs> as questions and comments lead us on certain pathways, we certainly want to be able to follow them if they're interesting. Uh, so let me, be, I have the honor of throwing out the first question, uh, and then I will turn to my colleague, Ellen Toscano. But the first question uh, directed to the author, Congressman Bonnier. In many ways, David, this is a book about journeys. 
um, the journey of Maria Elena and her children from Honduras through Mexico to the US border and those they meet along the way. Uh, the journey of Sister Mary from uh, the shores of Lake Huron in Michigan to the Vatican by way of Haiti and Lampedusa. And of course, the journeys of Pope Francis, um, who in many of his visits around the globe bears witness to the plight of migrants worldwide and his desire to connect with people long neglected. I also have the feeling that in reading this that you yourself have been on a journey, um, not only as an author from nonfiction to fiction, but as an advocate and someone who cares deeply about policies in Central and Latin America, uh, and perhaps as a, as a person of faith, as a Catholic yourself and someone who's watching um, the developments in the Catholic Church. So uh, help us understand uh, your journey within those other journeys, if you would. Well, thank you, Lynn. It's wonderful to be with you and Ellen and Jeff uh, and those who have joined us today to talk about the book and the issues that surround the book, specifically the issues of the Catholic Church uh, and at this really important time for the church, as well of, as well as the uh, migration issue that is not only uh, relevant here in our hemisphere at our border, but of course around the world. We've got about 20 six million people who are in refugee camps or displaced around the globe. And it's a huge, huge problem. And it needs to be addressed in a serious way. Uh, so yes, it is a journey. And for Marina Elena, who is a mother of four uh, in this book, uh, sh sh she makes the decision to, to leave because of the violence that is challenging her and her, and her family. And, um, and so with the help and counsel of a priest, uh, she makes the journey of uh, 1,425 miles. Uh, there's another person on this journey that uh, from another part of Honduras, his name is Jose Aguilar. He does it by foot. So he sleeps in the woods. He sleeps in church vestibules. He, he does everything that you need to do. He dodges the police. He dodges uh, from the government authorities. And of course, the gangs uh, that are out there and are predators for those who are making the, these journeys. Uh, they do meet these two families, Jose uh, Aguilar and the Gonzalez family with her, Maria Elena with the four kids. And uh, they form a bond and they hope to see each other at another point, which I won't get to because it's part of the surprise at the end of the book. But anyway, this is, a, this is a long journey for them. But the church is also on a journey. It's on a journey of, of 2000 years. Mm -hmm. And it's been an uneven journey. Uh, I think for me, the thing about the church's journey that is most troublesome is the lack of gender equality in the church. And that's really significant because as far as I'm concerned, the church began with women taking important leaderships, having the first churches in their homes, Priscilla, Phoebe that are mentioned uh, in the Old Testament. These were women who, who had significant roles to play. In fact, even Paul, the, the apostle, uh, Paul, Paul was told that, uh, he had to stay in his territory, uh, mm -hmm. not to infringe on the territory of the women who had, had churches in their homes. So, but somehow after maybe the third century, women were put in a position in a place in the Catholic church that uh, had second class status. And unfortunately has held all the way to this day, although Francis has tried to move the ball on that more than his predecessors have. Um, so that's a journey that the church is on. And the church is in a crisis because it's the biggest crisis, I think, since the Reformation 500 years ago, mm -hmm. with the 34-year-old sexual abuse crisis. And how 
Francis handles that is, is, is really important. Uh, and he's made some, actually some strides in that over the last uh, two years. But the year 2018 was, as one priest mentioned to me, uh, was a year in hell for the Catholic Church because of the scandals that erupted again, at least in the headlines uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania, in uh, Australia, in Ireland, you name it. Uh, this issue was not going away. So I try to deal with the, uh, the church issue, and I'll stop here because I know you have many other pieces you want to get to. The church issue is significant in this, in this regard for me. There are wonderful people in the Catholic Church today who do tremendous things, wonderful good work, and I wanted to highlight that piece. And that piece is highlighted in the struggle of trying to get these people up through Central mm -hmm. America mm -hmm. in, in the shelters that they're in, in the churches that receive them, and the good works that the nuns and the priests and the Catholic lay people do for the church that are out there every day doing marvelous things in education and in healthcare, taking care of people with COVID, you name it, they're there. And then there's the ugly underbelly of the church that, that showed itself, of course, uh, during this sexual abuse scandal. Ellen, I want to turn to you now. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. So and I think that multi-layer, but uh, actually, Ellen, before you start, I neglected Sorry. to mention, um, so uh, forgive me, that um, actually when Ellen uh, was at her posting in Florence, Italy, she co-founded uh, a very important NYU project on women and migrations. So she's come at this topic um, over the last decade, also from the academic and programmatic arena, not just the political. Ellen? Thank you. Um, so Congressman Speaker Pelosi said of your book, this book is an expression of David Bonnier's compassion and his life of selfless public service. And I'd like to try to situate the book and this conversation a little bit in that history. Can you talk a bit about your work as a congressman, especially as it pertains to Latin America and um, migration? And can you talk about how this book is an extension or a reflection or maybe a response to the work you did in Congress? I can. And I'm gonna it ask was... Jeff the same thing when you're yeah. done. <laughs> it was really one of the mot motivating forces in, in writing, writing the book. And uh, as I, I should say before I even, touch on that piece of it. Uh, I had great help from uh, Henry Ferris, who was my editor. Uh, Henry worked on Eyes on the Prize and uh, uh, also uh, was a senior editor on uh, Barack Obama's work, uh, book uh, uh, that dealt with uh, dreams uh, from my fathers. So he, he's a very, very special person and he helped me with dialogue and, and nonfiction. Uh, to Ellen's concern, I, I got involved in Central America, uh, actually in a Catholic grade school. I had a nun basically who was interested in Haiti and Papa Doc and uh, how terrible he was. And, uh, and so she used to talk to us about it. And so when I went away to college, I kept that kind of interest going in, in my college education. I had a professor at Iowa named Peter Snow and he was, the Latin American professor at the University of Iowa where I attended. And I took all, basically all of his courses. Uh, when I got to Congress, uh, there was this vacancy on the Committee on Marine Affairs. And uh, so I was placed on it. And this was 76, I was just elected. I didn't know a, uh, what was going on from a cord of wood. I mean, I was brand new and went behind the ears. And Jimmy Carter was the new president and he wanted to do something about the Panama Canal. And we couldn't find anybody on the subcommittee to do anything. So he came to me, with, who I was the most junior member and I ended up going back and forth down to Panama trying to be helpful to figure out how we could you know, make the transfer over to Panama uh, from the canal zone and, and, and the running of the canal. Uh, so I did that for about three, four years and then I got involved in 
the because I was doing it, Tip O'Neill asked me to chair the 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 um, caucus in the United States House on Central America. And at that time, in the 80s, you had the war in Central America that was raging in three or four countries. In uh, Nicaragua and in Honduras, you had the Contra War, in which 20,000 people were killed over about a 12-year period. You had in El Salvador, the small, teeny little country that sits right below Honduras, another uh, a war, a brutal war, civil war in which more than 80 million, uh, 80,000, 80, excuse me, uh, people were killed. And then, and then you had in Guatemala, a three decade war. Uh, some people say genocide in which over almost a quarter million people were, were murdered, mostly by, by the government in, El, in uh, Guatemala. So those places were really places of, of violence. And uh, I was drawn into them and I visited them many times in the villages, I taught to the border and I got to know the people very well. And I said, someday I really wanna write about this. Mm. And I chose fiction because ironically, uh, I needed to write, I wanted to write about the Pope, but I also wanted to write about the migration and I needed some bridge characters to bring mm. it all together. And those I created in the novel uh, that had contacts with the Pope, but also with Central America. There are two priests that do that in the book. Uh, and then of course, on the issue of uh, women, I have a, a Father Soto who has been with Francis for 40 years and Sister Mary Bernard that you referred to Lynn as a nun who was trying to push the idea that we need women equality and that women are actually going to be the salvation of the church. We wouldn't have had 34 years of sexual abuse crisis if women were priests or bishops. We wouldn't have, that wouldn't have stood for that long of time. So anyway, those were the pieces that uh, uh, put this together. Okay. And Jeff, same, same thing to you. Can you comment a bit on uh, Congressman Bonnier's work on US policy in Latin America, but also, is this novel, how does this novel contribute to advocacy? And is the storytelling, his storytelling in the novel form contribute to an understanding of these issues in a way different than reading about policy in the paper? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so first of all, it's a great book. Um, I mean, I, let, me, let me talk about two strands, I think, um, in David Biner's career as a member of Congress that kind of inform the book. Um, one is a long commitment to uh, human rights and social justice in Latin America that I think, you know, begins with the Panama Canal work, with looking at Chile and Argentina in the late 1970s, and then with David's leadership in the, the House Democratic Task Force, um, leading the opposition to Contra Aid, leading a fight to end military assistance to El Salvador. So that's one whole strand on the policy side, and it's about um, opposition to a sort of black and white Cold War policy and a kind of mechanical, let's intervene everywhere sort of approach. Um, I mean, that's one side. The other side, and I think you see it in the book, is that that um, policy commitment is linked to an understanding that US policy changes um, when members of Congress and pol other policymakers combine with activists. And on Central America in particular, um, faith-based activists and church-based church activists are a huge part of the equation. And, um, you know, uh, Representative Bonnier and his staff played this really key role in kind of bringing those activist communities together with members of Congress to lead battles against intervention. So uh, you see that reflected in the book, I think, um, where you see both in you on the U.S. side and in Mexico and in uh, Honduras and Guatemala, um, local activists and faith-based activists playing key roles in helping people kind of make the journey from, you know, the violence of, of Tegucigalpa or San Pedro Sula uh, to the U.S. border. Um, and I just, this sort of final comment, I mean, I think what's great about the book, about that piece of the book, is that um, 
you understand why Maria Elena, why her kids, why Jesus decide to leave. And, you know, you read the account of the journey and it's terrifying, right? There's people killed along the way. There's robberies, there's violence, there's theft, all kinds of assault. Um, and they endure through it and they decide to endure through it because the conditions uh, that they have to endure living in San Pedro Sula or Tegus are so so dreadful. And I think the book makes that pretty clear in human terms, and that's really important. You know, as we're talking today about what's happening at the border and what is the Biden administration do, doing, instead of thinking about nameless migrants, thinking about actual human beings mm -hmm. is tremendously mm -hmm. helpful, and the book helps us do that. Put a face to it. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to turn, there's actually a question in the q and I'd like to bring in our participants and audience because it actually is something, um, I had a question that riffs a bit on it. And it talks about, David, the, the, the fundamental challenge of change in a religion, in an established religion, that when, when you, back to Vatican II, says the questioner, you know, when you try to change things, you get people who just decide, I don't, I don't want change. And I was struck as well. So, so the question is, how fast can change come in a church? And what are the mainsprings of making progress? But it is true that I was struck in the book and something we haven't touched on yet. There's a whole section on the Vatican and sort of life within the Vatican. And you can see Francis constantly maneuvering among factions of ideological camps in the wing. Uh, you know, you, you, one is reminded he's not just a pastoral and a spiritual leader, but the head of a vast enterprise with a lot of um, uh, competing interests. And he's in that section, he's always looking for opportunities um, to advance his agenda, but without blowing up the curia, uh, our questioner has it without provoking a schism uh, it, and, you know, testing the waters sort of reminded me of what a majority whip has to do in the House of Representatives. <laughs> um, so it was interesting. Um, what are your insights actually informed not only by your observation of the church and being a member of it since a child, but also your understanding of politics, small p, of um, what are the prospects for change? How fast can Francis make them, I guess, and at what cost? Well, good question and excellent uh, point. Uh, change comes slowly to the Catholic Church. Uh, Vatican II was a huge, huge departure from from that, uh, when John the Twenty Third took command and 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 opened up the church to other religions, it was a more open, lo lovable, uh, inclusive church. Uh, but it left some people behind, and it is still leaving some people behind. It's leaving women behind. It's leaving uh, LBGT folks behind. Uh, it's leaving divorced Catholics behind uh, who want to be part of the church. And it's got to find a way to get there. And it seems to me the center of the crux of the problem on these three pieces that I've just mentioned have to do with sexuality. There was a wonderful book that was written by Tom Fox, who was the former public, was, was the publisher of the National Catholic Reporter, a really fabulous uh, publication, by the way. It's independent of the church, and, uh, but it, it's, it cares deeply about the church in trying to make the church better. Uh, and he points out in his book, and I actually have a copy here, it's called Sexuality and Catholicism. It's old, it's 25 years old. And he sent it to me, and he says, too bad this book still is relevant after 25 <laughs> years, because things really haven't changed in the areas on the abortion question and homosexuality, on women in the church, birth control, clergy and sex abuse, uh, celibacy, population control. There really hasn't been much progress at all, and some backsliding even. And for the church to move forward, it seems to me, it has 
to face up to these issues. 90% of the Catholics anywhere in the world will tell you that they don't agree with the church's position on birth control, but yet it is the foundation of which many of the other issues that I've just touched on are, are based upon. And I think the church is worried that if you crack that, these other pieces are gonna crack. So to your point, Lynn, yes, there always, there's always this tug of war going on between the traditionalists in the church and what I would term as the more progressive elements of the church that wanna move forward on a lot of these issues. It's a, it's a great uh, political tug of war uh, that goes on and it culminates in the election of the Pope. And Francis was a big surprise, even though I think he had a, uh, a, a mistake this week in the church. And we may want, want to talk about that regarding the, what he said about the uh, LBGT uh, issue. Um, and we can chat about that if you want in a, in a little bit. Uh, he think basically though he has been trying to move the ball forward on on some of these issues. But you got to understand that Francis is a product of who where he comes from as well. He comes from Italy, Argentina, and the Roman Catholic Church, and the, those places have on the issue of you know, sexuality have not really been uh, progressive with regards to thinking about women. And, and that's a big, the big obstacle. So this book is, is part of an attempt to create a vision for the future. It's sort of David Bonyer's attempt <laughs> at what I would like to see in the church. And that's why the end of the book takes the dramatic step that it does. Uh, and I won't talk about that because it's a <laughs> surprise, but it makes a difference on some of those issues that I just referred to. So Ellen speaking, this is now is to you as, um... That's right. So the centrality of, or the non-centrality of women to the church, but the grappling of the Catholic church with women. And then of course, women are at the center of this book in so many ways. So let yeah, me- the, Actually, I, I think that women in some ways are the drivers of the narratives of this book. And they're depicted as sources of strength and hope. Um, women left behind, not only women who are migrating, but women left behind as- Husbands and sons uh, migrate. Women who take their families on this dangerous journey to flee danger. Sisters, religious women who uh, help migrants on their journey and their arrival at the border. A woman, Dr. Lynn mentioned her earlier, an advisor to the Pope, exemplifying how the voices of women could maybe change uh, policy. And then in the fictional dream of Pope Francis, his grandmother Rosa, saying to him, look to women, for they can be the salvation of the church. So why are women's stories central to this novel? And in fact, in to your thinking about justice and reform, not only in church, in the church, but in um, the policy towards migrants and towards Central America. This is to me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, they're central because uh, because they're central. <laughs> because without them, yeah. we are we are we are very limited. And I thought it was important in that dream. I'm glad you mentioned the dream uh, chapter. It was one of the my favorite chapters to write, uh, Ellen. And. Uh, there's a vision that the Pope has of uh, Our Lady, her arms spread, and under her arms on her right and her left are great women of courage. And I list them throughout history. Mary Magdalene, uh, 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 St. Teresa of Lisieux, uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, hmm. Milana, the woman uh, in Afghanistan that, who was shot in the head as a child. Uh, uh, you know, the, a whole bunch of strong, courageous women who have made a difference and are making a difference. Uh, Mary Magdalene, I think I mentioned as well. They're, they're part of his, his dream and 
of course, his grandmother, who he was, Pope Francis was very close to his grandmother, maybe even more so than uh, other people in his family. And uh, she had a great influence on him. So I thought perhaps she might have an influence here. So I put her into this, this, this particular scene. Uh, in addition to that, I, and, and in chapter after that, there was a letter, this is a true story, written by a, po, uh, a cardinal out of uh, Milan by the name of Martini, who died in, I think it was nine, uh, 2012. But he had also a vision and he was a progressive and Francis knew him and liked him. And this letter was made public after he had passed away, um, Cardinal Martini. And, and so his basic letter was, you know, our churches are empties, the pews are empties, the, the people aren't studying to be priests anymore, you know, on and on and on. And we need, we need the church to take hold of this and, and become a church of excitement and hope and, and passion. And he calls, for, uh, he calls for a revival of 12, like the original 12 apostles. And so this is a letter that's a significant letter for Francis in the book. And uh, it, I think probably in real life as well. Uh, so the, the women's piece is, a, is, is very important as, as it is in beyond religion, but, but in, in, in this institution of a, million, a billion people that the Pope runs, it's significant. And if it's going to continue to grow, uh, it, it, needs, needs, it needs women as, as participants at the highest levels of the church. You know, when I was young man, uh, the Catholic Church is, was the biggest in number in Europe and in North America. It was like 70-30 compared to Latin America, Asia, and Africa. It's reversed today. The church is still growing. It's growing in Asia and Africa and Latin America. That's why its numbers stay pretty much where they have recently been. But it's really declining. For instance, in the United States, it used to be 25% of the population. Today, it's probably 20% of the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do you reverse that? Well, if it's a church of justice and love and inclusion, then it seems to me uh, it needs to include everybody, <laughs> not to exclude people. And I think Francis is trying to get there, but, and he's had some success, but this latest uh, faux pas, which continues to be on my mind because it was so hurtful regarding uh, uh, marriage, same-sex same, same -sex marriage and the comments that the church made and, and referred to as sin, was is a real, real significant setback and a problem. Yeah. And David, I think we will turn to that. Um because it's been on my mind as well. Um, but Ellen, why don't, um, before we leave the border, <laughs> which as you say is in the headlines every day, I want to yeah. do turn to Ellen because she's had some thoughts on what we see happening right now. Uh, right, and, and maybe Jeff, you can help us think about this. So, and also in addition to women, children are a particular, um, yeah. of a particular concern in David's book from Maria Elena and her, four children Four traveling on this dangerous journey to the 15 year old coming from Honduras who joins up with a young man from El Salvador to even the 7,000 orphaned children in Italy um, traveling from North Africa through Lampedusa. Yeah. And now, I mean, in today's news, more than 9,400 unaccompanied children cross the border. Yeah. The southern border of the United States in February alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, how do we think about this special problem of children? Uh, what failure of policy does it represent? And what challenges does Biden face? Should he be addressing not just the surge at the border, but the causes of this terrible yeah. migration from the Northern Triangle? Can I just a really quick comment on that? That's a great question and a great point. I mean, 
It's really clear if you look at the U.S. <clears throat> at numbers in the U.S.-Mexican border of apprehensions over the last decade, that migration that used to be primarily single men looking for work right. has mm -hmm. become heavily families and unaccompanied right. kids. Right. And what that reflects is a shift from um, the drivers of migration primarily being unemployment uh, and lack of opportunity to drivers that include violence, corruption, insecurity in people's home communities that affect um, families and particularly affect kids. And I think if you're going to address this problem, um, there isn't a magic answer overnight, right. but you need both humane treatment of the, you need to first of all, recognize this reality, right? You need to have the capacity to receive and process unaccompanied kids and not, uh, you know, hold them at border patrol posts for five days before you move them on to shelters and so on. So you need to recognize the problem and have capacity. And then you need to start to look at what in Central America in particular, but also in Mexico increasingly, is driving large numbers of families and kids out. And that means helping to think about how you address the problems of insecurity and violence. And I mean, sadly, in different forms, these are all the issues that led to the wars in Central America in the 1980s. Yeah. And some of those problems got addressed with peace processes, and there's a lot that remain. And it's a result of that that we see these flows today. So. Yeah. There's a question in the in the Q&A chat, too, that somewhat might bear on this, or we could get both David and, and Jeff's viewpoint on it, too, is basically how have the last four years, especially of a, yeah. a policy of America only, you control your borders and you control your people and stop the migration flow, said to Latin American and Central American countries, how has the America only policy um, What's the legacy? And obviously, President Biden is now in, uh, reaping the whirlwind of some of that. But your comments on that, too. David, maybe, and then Jeff? Sure. Yeah, why don't Jeff take, take that, and then I'll piggyback on him. Okay. Okay, just a couple quick things. Um, I mean, most immediately, I should say, the, um, you know, the flow we're seeing at the moment of kids and migrants is a result of the Trump administration in the last two years, particularly bottling up the border. And you've got thousands of people held in Mexico uh, and you've got um, tens of thousands of people uh, backing up because we shut down the border entirely in the context of COVID. And so the, the, the surge, right, that you see right now is in some ways the result of that pent up backlog. But in kind of bigger terms, and, and will probably smooth out a bit over time. In bigger terms, though, you know, the Trump administration took this um, uh, deterrence only strategy. We don't want foreigners here. Um, and that both led to ICE abuses of families in the United States to kid, you know, the sort of kids in cages phenomenon. Uh, and this whole notion that, um, the way you could stop migration is to scare people to death. And the reality is, the reality of Central America, and the book I think illustrates this, people are scared to death to stay there. Yeah. And so they make yeah. the choice to come anyway. And the reality is it's migration, good. you know, and I think Ellen made this point, right? Not just in the United States, not just to the United States, but worldwide, and David said this as well. Migration is this huge phenomenon and it's not ending. The challenge is to figure out how to manage it humanely and successfully not to scare us all to death and prevent it. And I think that's where we are. I, I think one of the problems, well, the problem, uh, besides the economic insecurities in the uh, Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, is the fact, uh, and Mexico, you can include in this as well, is, is the lack of the rule of law, I, 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 you can't exaggerate, I think, how, how, how poor it is, poorly it is, uh, to live in, a, in, 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 in some of these states in Mexico and, and in these other countries uh, that I mentioned, uh, because the rule of law does not work for people. Right. If there's a crime committed, people don't even bother often yeah. to... To report the crime because the police could be in cahoots with the drug cartel yeah. and the gangs and it's they rule with impunity mm -hmm. and that's totally out of it's a totally out of control and that's why people decide to lead with their feet 
in such you know difficult situations and it's dangerous to leave with your feet to make that trek up all the way to the u.s border because it's filled with hurdles and gangs and authorities that uh, right. government authorities that that aren't kind to say the least yeah it's a huge huge thing to do and to leave your people that you love your your, mm -hmm. your parish your community uh your neighbors uh but people do it because they have really yeah. no choice. So why do I say this? I say this because this is a long-term problem. And if we're going to address it, we, we've got to do something uh, with respect to making these countries accountable. And that needs to come from the top of the U.S. government uh, and from the private sector as well in terms of investment. We've got to make sure that the people that respect human life and uh, liberties, uh, and the governments that do that are rewarded. The ones that don't are not rewarded. We've got to create the dynamics for this to happen. I recall during the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s in Europe, there were you know, basically three tiers of countries in terms of their economic wherewithal. And uh, in order for them to join the European Union, they had to meet certain goals. You know, they had to certain human rights standards uh, and uh, environmental standards and other standards to get into the Union. And it worked. It brought a lot of countries into, yeah. the, into, into the Union. We need something like that. And I know that, that Biden is, is, is suggested, uh, and by the way, so did Ob uh, Obrador, the president of Mexico, AMLO, he suggested yeah. as well a Marshall Plan for, for Central America. We need something like that, but it can't be episodic. You can't have three years of it under one president and then a presidency like Trump where you forget about it. It doesn't work that way. It's gotta be, right. it's, 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 it's gotta be more consistent. And, and until we have that, unfortunately, I think you're gonna continue to have uh, these migration issues. By the way, most of these kids now that are coming across uh, are between the ages of 15 and 17. That's yeah. kind of where the ages are. You have some that are younger, six and seven, and you can see in the photos that we ran at the beginning of the show that there are young people. But there's a lot of teenagers, and the most, a lot of them are, are mostly, mostly boys now and, and young men. And uh, uh, so we will see what what transpires, but once they get here, uh, they 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 will find eventually relatives. About eighty percent of them end up with yeah. some kind of relative, uh, and they wait for their asylum hearing, and that can take anywhere from Jeff can tell you probably better than I can, or maybe Ellen, but that can take anywhere from a year to two years to, to get an asylum hearing because of the backlog. So you've got to build up that judicial infrastructure as well in the United States to deal with that piece mm -hmm. of, of the migration issue. Yeah. So long time making and a long time in consistent policy to have it turn around as well. Yeah. Let me just um, bring you back to that question about the recent uh, decision by the Catholic Church, David, because you said it was on your mind. And again, it was... Um, uh, certainly timely and that this was last week. What David's referring to is the uh, congregation, uh, the congregation of the doctrine of faith, which is the um, body in the Vatican that decides on questions that should go. Very powerful out. body, yeah. Very powerful body. Um, the Vatican doesn't have checks and balances. It's not three, this is the, um, the question that had been proposed before the congregation into which they delivered their ruling last week was, does the church have the power to grant blessings? It's a term of art in the Catholic church, blessings to unions of persons of the same sex. It's not a sacrament in the hierarchy, but a blessing has a certain stature. And the response um, came back with Francis signs off on these uh, in the negative. Um, and the message was delivered. So that's what David was referring to that disappointed him 
even this week, as he was talking about the church being at this pivotal moment, deciding whether to open up and be more inclusive or to pull back. This would seem a moment of pulling back. But David, why don't you comment on that? Um, well, you know, the church and priests, they bless a lot of different things. They, they bless the uh, students, they bless teachers, they bless the sick, uh, they bless prison inmates, they bless new buildings. I'm looking out here in the Chesapeake Bay. They bless boats, they bless cars, they bless, you know, warplanes, and they do all kinds of blessings, and, and God bless them for it. But, but, but anyway, uh, but they can't find it in them uh, to bless same-sex couples who have gotten married and are expressing their love to each other. And, it, you know, the, the Pope initially, early in his papacy, was said, and we all know this, the phrase, and it took the world really by surprise somewhat because we're not used to a Pope saying, who am I to, uh, what was it, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? Yeah. And yeah. Like, people were going, wow, that's, that's somebody who's trying to be open-minded here. And then there have been other things that have done that have moved the ball a little bit along the way to be more sensitive to the community, to try to bring them into the church more. And then this hit, and it was kind of like a jolt because the way it was couched, it was couched as if it was a sin and is a sin in the church's eyes. And I, I, it's, so it was very disturbing in that regard. I, you know, the cat, uh, Heidi Shrump, who is the executive editor of the National Catholic Reporter said something yesterday that I thought was, was very good. And I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just see if I can find it here and read it because I think uh, she said this, the church should take the advice of parents around the world. If you can't say something nice, it's better not to say nothing at all. Right. And uh, I think, you know, they would have been better off saying nothing at all. Yeah. Ellen, I want to give you a chance to enter again with a question and then we're, we're coming Maybe to we'll do close. Yeah. So, Congressman, I wanted you, you began the book with a very beautiful true story of Pope Francis's exchange with a young boy, Emanuele, in 2018 in Rome. Can you briefly tell that story and comment on why you chose that sure. incident to begin your book? Yeah. Well, uh, he was meeting early in his papacy. Uh, in Rome in a working class neighborhood. And he was sitting on stage and he had two prelates, two cardinals sitting next to him. And there was a microphone about 30 feet away. And school children were coming up, were going to be coming up and asking him questions. And this one boy, about nine years old, his name is Ellen, has said Emanuele, came up and he couldn't get his question out uh, in front of the mic. And the priest who was next to him kept, kept encouraging him and he still couldn't, and then he buried his head <laughs> in his hands and started to cry. And the Pope said, finally, come, come to me. So Emmanuel goes to the Pope and they kind of huddle and whisper to each other. And while this is going on, it's being shown on a big screen, a camera for all the people in the neighborhood that's sitting way in the back so they could see what was happening. And they're whispering. And, talking to each other and the Pope is very tender with Emanuele and finally he lets Emanuele go and Emanuele goes back to his seat with the other students and again puts his hand, hands in his head and starts to cry. The Pope then very uh, dramatically says to the crowd, I asked Emanuele permission to give you his question and he said yes. So I will tell you what happened. <laughs> Emanuele says to me that his father, who was a non-believer, had the four of his children baptized. He died recently. Is my father in heaven? Who? Tough question. So the Pope says, I Pope pauses for a while and he lets it kind of sink into the crowd. And then he, he, he asks this question, who is it that really 
decides who goes to heaven. It's God who decides. But what is Emmanuel's, Emmanuel's, Emmanuel's father like? He's a dad. He's a good dad. And wouldn't God like to have, you know, be with a good dad? And basically, that is the answer to your question. God decides who goes to heaven. But with a good man like your father, uh, it's probably, well, he didn't say this, but, but the, imp 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 the impression that he leaves is that he would be with God. And what is so significant about that, I think, is that, you know, I talked earlier about opening up the church to women, and I talked about the difficulty in the churches having opening it up to divorce Catholics or LBGT folks, Catholics. But this is a step beyond. This is yeah. opening up the church to the non-believer. And I thought it was uh, an exceptional uh, act of mercy on the, on the part of Francis, the way he handled that. It was beautiful. Thank so you. that's a, a nice segue to, it is, it's a very moving opening for the book. And as we say, we're not gonna tell you about the endings because that introduces some surprises uh, in terms of the journey of our migrants as well as the Pope. But that, that thought, David, um, leads me to ask this final question and, and I'm open to actually uh, Jeff's comments on this as well. But within the last several weeks, the Pope of course has made yet another quite dramatic trip, this one to Iraq. Uh, and obviously the, the home of the three Abrahamic religions. And this was very important. And his stubbornness in pushing that trip forward reminds me very much of the passage in your book about the Pope insisting to go to Lampedusa. I'm going, I'm going. No one will get him tickets. No one will get him help. And he just calls up Alitalia on his own. And you could see that same stubbornness um, in the press reports, at least of the Pope pushing this forward. Um, but to your point about the interfaith gesture that this represented on the part of the Pope, um, it certainly um, is part of what you're talking about with uh, uh, not making baptism in the Catholic church a sine qua non of, of God's decision of who gets into heaven. But just your comments on that, we have seven minutes just to give my panelists a, a time check. But your comments on, um, uh, on that, David, especially with you sort of getting into Francis's head um, for this book of what you, what dynamics were at work with the trip to Iraq and what significance you think it had. Well, I can imagine people in the Curia telling him not to go, but maybe not so much this late in his papacy because they know Francis a little bit because of what you just told Lynn regarding his first trip to Lampedusa, which is, he was just made Pope and we had all these horrific things happening of people leaving uh, Syria and Nigeria from the Boko uh, Haram and Syria from the Dante-esque horrors that were going on there and trying to get to Europe. So they got across the Mediterranean and 25,000 of them perished at sea, trying to get there. And many of them, hundreds of thousands, ended up in this small little island of Lampedusa, which is the southernmost part of Italy, but closer to uh, the North African shore than to actually Rome. But uh, anyway, he, he wanted to go there right away. And his secretary of state discouraged him twice on the phone from going, didn't discourage him, but tried to discourage him on the phone. <laughs> and the third time, as Lynn said, he just called up Air Italia and got a, got a ticket and was gonna go by himself. And finally they got the message. Uh, so he's, you know, when he wants to do something, he, he, he does it. And this trip to Iraq uh, was really an important, visit because of the Abrahamic significance of it. And, the, and, and it's an extension of the opening of Vatican II that uh, Pope mm -hmm. John the 23rd was, in, was instrumental in. Uh, he is, you know, revered 
uh, around the world in, in, in a very special way because he, you know, he takes on the bureaucracy, he takes on issues that other other popes had, had not. And uh, so I very thankful that he made the trip. Uh, you know, he saw, he's, he's seen the destruction in Syria and in Iraq and uh, other places in the Middle East. And it's, it's been terrible. And of course, in some of these places, the Catholic church is a, is a, is a, is a minority, small minority, mm -hmm. but they do have a long history. For instance, they do in history and excuse me, in, in Syria. Uh, so it was an important trip to make. Yeah. Jeff, any comment too? I mean, this is another part of the world that has, as you <laughs> all have noticed, been subject to the same kind of yeah. devastating move, movement of people forced out by war and famine and other uh, non-life-sustaining developments. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that was going to be my only comment that... Um, in addition to the significance of this trip, because the Pope decided to make it sort of despite all the obstacles in the way, in the importance of it as an interfaith gesture, it's also, um, you know, kind of the war in Iraq is one of the detonating factors in this flood of migrants and mm -hmm. refugees that have washed ashore through Northern Africa and into Europe. And, you know, Ellen did a lot of work on this and saw this in Italy and we've seen it all over there and it's parallel to what we see in Central America today. So I think it's a, a significant statement about the concern that Francis in particular, and hopefully from that, the church largely will have is playing in playing a positive role in, in addressing the realities and the you know human costs of migration. Right. And it, just his very presence, as it did in Lampedusa, and you're in the book, well, it was a real trip to David, uh, the Pope's visit obviously brings attention to this. It's a spotlight that you can't yeah. recreate sure. very easily. And so, so easy for us always to forget, and the Pope's trip brought this out, at least three or four days of extensive coverage. Oh, yeah, remember all that that went on <laughs> yeah. and all the, the damage that was left in its wake. All right, Congressman Bonnier, I yield the balance of my time <laughs> to the distinguished gentleman from Michigan who has two minutes to uh, wrap up and uh, tell us and our audience anything else about the book that we haven't covered. Well, I wanna thank you uh, very much, Lynn, and uh, uh, Ellen and, uh, and Jeff and all the NYU people. And uh, I'm on the board of the Bradman Center, so it's been a pleasure to, do, to a work in behalf of the name of a really great guy, uh, John Bradimus, and with you, Lynn, for all these years. Uh, and I appreciate those who have tuned in to listen as well and to see and to hopefully learn and to help educate us as, as well. Uh, I would say on the book itself, all the proceeds from the book are going to um, a, the National Catholic Reporter publication called Earthbeat, which is a terrific new environmental piece that deals with environmental justice and with the climate crisis. So if you're interested uh, uh, in that aspect of the work that the Catholic Reporter does, which is excellent, I suggest, uh, you know, getting the book and I think maybe you'll enjoy it. It's got a great <laughs> ending, I think, uh, if I might be so, so immodest to suggest that. And I think you'll find it uh, worth the read. And I thank you for the opportunity to to share these thoughts and ideas, and hopefully we'll more move towards a more just and merciful society, and uh, we'll get there, but it's a slow, slow move, movement sometimes. <laughs> Dark of history. Well, thank and you, and thank my fellow conversationalists, Ellen Toscano and Jeff Thale. Both David and Ellen are on the advisory council of the Bradema Center. So Jeff, you'll be getting your invitation. <laughs> I'm delighted. <laughs> You're now uh, an unofficial official member. And thanks to my uh, uh, great staff, Tom McIntyre, Kevin Mealman, who help us behind the scenes put this together. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, get the book. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Nice to see everyone. Nice to Bye. see you. Bye. 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 Bye.